Hi everyone and welcome to round 3 of the FIDE Candidates Tournament in Madrid. In this video we'll have a look at all of the games that were played today. Now going into this round, Jan Pomnyshi and Fabiana Caruana were still in the lead with 1.5 points out of 2 games. So let's have a look at how they did. So the very first game that came to an end was the game between Tamar Rajabov and Jan Pomnyshi. In which Rajabov opened the game with 1d4, that is 6 by black, pawn a c4 e6 by Nepo, so he wants to play the Nimzo Indian defense, knight of 3, d5, and g3 by Rajabo. So he's taking the game into the Catalan. All right, so in the World Championship match against Magnus Carlsen, Nepo played the line with bishop e7, and he went into this line, which became quite trendy, where black um, gives up this pawn on b5 and potentially sacrifices a pawn, but black gets a lot of uh, compensation. Now Magnus did something slightly different in this position. He played the move knight e5, which was very uncommon. Oh, sorry. Which was very, uh, no, it wasn't this position in which he played knight e5, which was very uncommon at the time. But um, Jan lost some games later on. He lost to Wesley So in a, in a super tournament in Romania. So he decided to switch it up in this game. Now in this game, after the move g3, he decided to take a pawn on c4, and after bishop g2, to go c5 castles and knight c6 so black takes a pawn and is immediately putting a lot of pressure on white center so Rajabov took on c5 Nepo traded the queens and now took the pawn on c5 all right so Rajabov goes knight bd2 and here black cannot keep holding on to the pawn on c4 so Nepo decided like okay if i'm gonna lose a pawn anyway i'm gonna weaken white's pawn structure first by going b3 by going c3 white takes but now white has these isolated pawns on the queen side so Nepo castled, knight b3, hitting the bishop, bishop b7, and here Rajabov went for a bit of a thing. So it's showing again that Rajabov's preparation for the tournament has not been the best in the world. He got into a lot of trouble uh, in the first game in this uh, yesterday, sorry, with the black piece against Hikaru right at the opening, and here he wasn't really able to put any pressure with white. Anyway, he played the move knight fd4, bishop to d7 by Nepo, and here Rajabov decided to trade on c6, which isn't really the most ambitious way of playing this position. Anyway, he took, Nepo recaptured, white took, black recaptured, and so we get this very symmetrical structure, where right? both sides have isolated c and a pawns. White is, of course, still a tiny bit better. This knight on b3 could potentially help to a5 to put some pressure, but according to the theory, black holds here, black is fine. So, uh, Rajabov played bishop b3, knight on d5. Oh, shoot. Knight d5, sorry. By Nepo, hitting the bishop and the pawn on c3. So Rajabov played bishop d4. And now c5. A very nice equalizing move by Nepo. He's distracting this bishop from d4. So Rajabov took. Like, recaptured. White took. And rook fc8. So he's hitting the bishop and the pawn on c3 as well. So Rajabov played bishop d4. Knight takes c3. They traded the minor pieces, rook ac1 by Rajabov, and here a very instructive move by Nepo. Now some of you guys might think like, okay, if you want to make a draw here, what you have to do is just trade a lot of pieces. But the problem is, in this endgame, you're going to be worse, because your rook will be stuck defending this pawn over here. Or like, well, I can play someone like rook c5, followed by a4, and black is very passive in this endgame, and then white is slowly going to push up the board on the king side, and this will become quite unpleasant. So Nepo played a much better move. Nepo played the move rook to a3. So the, with the rook on a3, he's always putting pressure on this pawn, and he's always defending his own pawn on a7. So Rajalov played rook to c2 to defend. Now h5 by Nepo. Rook to d7, a6. King g2, g6. e3, king g7. And yeah, there isn't really much that both sides can do. Rajalov played rook c c7. Hitting pawn f7, so Nepo played rook f8. Now came rook d6, hitting the pawn e6, so Nepo defended it. I wouldn't recommend taking this pawn on a2 because white is going to take this pawn on e6, and we'll probably be able to pick up this pawn on a6 later on, and then we'll then white will get a four versus three majority on the king side. That is a draw, but then white can still torture black for uh, a lot of moves. But Nepo played the more precise rook to e8 to defend the pawn. And after rook d7, rook f8, rook d6, rook e8, rook d7, the game ended in a threefold repetition and therefore a draw. So, not the most exciting game of the day for sure. Let's have a look at what happened in the other games. 
All right, so in this game, we had Ding Loren, who was on half a point out of two games. Not really the start he was hoping for. He got crushed in the first game by Yana Pomishi. So let's see how he tries to come back, right? I mean, only first place counts in this tournament. So if you're on minus one, you have to win games. You have to try to come back as quickly as possible. And he was playing Rich Rapport, or Richard Rapport, as I'm told I should say. Um, Richard messed up, messed up a winning position yesterday against Ali Reza Ferugia. So, you know, he might have been a bit disappointed. But let's see. So Ding Loren opens up with 1d4. Uh, knight f6 by Richard, c4, and g6, which, you know, is a little bit surprising because Richard generally doesn't go for the Grunfeld defense. He's played the King's Indian on a couple of occasions, but not really in classical. And I think Ding was expecting more something like, you know, the Nimzo or something along those lines. But anyway, we have a Grunfeld. So Ding goes for the classical main line by turning on d5 and putting a spot on e4 and here to move bishop to c4. Now, this was heavily discussed in the World Championship match between Garry Kasparov and Anatoly Karpov in 1987 in Sevilla. Um, so c5, knight e2, knight c6, bishop e3, castles, castles. And here's really the starting point of the bishop c4 line, the, the tabia, as the Russians would say. Now, here black has a lot of moves. In that match, Gary played the move bishop g4, and after f3, knight a5. And white go in a pawn here by taking on a sand first and then taking on g4, but according to theory, black holds here, but anyway, there's a lot of uh, chess history involved here, so bishop g4 has always been one of the main moves, um, after that, like later bishop d3 become more popular, black would take on d4 and go bishop b6, and here white would sacrifice the exchange with the move d5, and especially Topalov had won some great games in this line, but uh, black found ways to hold here as well. Anyway, in this game, Richard plays for what I would call the new main line, which is the move b6. It's been played um, quite a lot by MVL. I also had a game in this line with the black pieces. And the thing is, b6 looks a bit weird, because white can take here, and he gets to immediately undouble his pawns. But black is known to be fine here, according to the theory. The line continues with queen and c7. There's some theory involved, but uh, like I said, black does hold the balance. Anyway, in this game, Ding decides to go rook c1, so instead of taking the pawn, he's just slowly improving his pieces. Bishop to b7 by Richard, bishop b5, rook to c8 by black, and queen d2. A very typical move in the Grunfeld, and as I was co doing coverage for this game, I expected Richard to play the move e6, to make sure that white can never really go for h4, h5. But instead of that, he traded on d4 and played the move queen d6. So... By going e6, black stops white from ever pushing this pawn to d5 and hit the knight. So, Ding could have very much considered to move d5 here. However, black would have probably gone knight e5. And if white goes f4, knight g4, hitting this bishop over here. And if bishop d4, probably to move e5. And all of this gets very, very complicated, but it does seem that black is probably doing fine here. But anyway, Ding played the move rook f to d1. Queen to b4 by Richard. And why can't trade the queens here? But black is generally doing fine in these types of endgames. So Ding decided to just play the move queen to d3. Keeping the queens on the board. Now e6 by Richard. And now finally h4 by Ding. I quite like this move. If white makes a couple moves, he can go h5, maybe h6. And this pawn will always be a thorn in black's eye. Because of the pawn on h6, black will always have a weak back rank. And, you know, there could easily be some tactics along the c-file. Besides, black has to be careful that all of a sudden a queen doesn't end up on g7, which would be checkmate. Anyway, Richard goes rook after d8, putting pressure on the pawn on d4, and then goes bishop g5, hitting the rook. And here black has a difficult decision to make. If you go f6, then white just drops back, and black has severely weakened his king side, is also blocking the bishop, it's no longer taking the pawn over here. And, well, if you go rook d7, you walk into all sorts of tactics with d5, hitting the rook like this. So, Richard came up with a different solution. He decided to sacrifice the exchange. Alright, so Ding took, black recaptured. And since this knight is pinned, Ding decided, like, you know what, let me just go h5, continue with my plan. But, I feel like without a dark squared bishop, uh, there isn't really, like, the fact that black has gotten rid of the dark squared bishop has really taken a sting out of this h5, h6 push. So Richard just goes bishop e5, a4 by Ding, 
and king g7 right he's pretty good control over the dark source and here ding play the move king to f1 so to make sure the knight takes e2 does not come with a check um and here richard decided to take anyway now here i was quite surprised because i expected ding to take this rook on d8 and things get pretty complicated black can take an e4 but then we take an e2 and black takes over here but there isn't really a checkmate so black probably still has play here but i feel like white is probably winning here but uh instead of that black can also take on c1 but here white has the very strong move queen to g5 he's hitting the bishop also threatening a6 h6 all sorts of checkmating attacks so perhaps ding missed something along those lines because in the game he took on e2 with the queen now richard traded and played a6 white took the pawn and after a lot of exchanges, black took the pawn on e4. So the dust has settled a little bit. White is up in exchange for a pawn, though. So the question is, can white win? Well, it's not that easy because black can very often put his bishop on d4, where it will defend this bishop, where it will defend this pawn on b6, and potentially anchor it in with a move e5. And black is generally doing pretty fine if he manages to achieve all of that. And probably here's where Ding made quite an inaccuracy. He should have probably traded on g6 and then go for the move queen e2 to make sure that this king, this queen has to go to f5. And it's a little bit further away from the queen side where white will, will then try to go after the b6 pawn later. But Ding played rook to e1. Now came queen e4 and now queen e2 hitting the bishop once more. Bishop f6 was played. They traded the pawns on g6 and Ding played queen e4. All right, so he wants to get the, he wants to trade off the queens. And then once again, try to put pressure on the spawn uh, over there. So b5 should definitely not be played. But queen e2 was a pretty good move by Richard. He wants to bring his bishop to d4. And there it will create quite annoying threats towards the white king. Now Ding was getting pretty low on time here. So he played the move rook to e2. So Richard gave a check and went back. But at least Ding got two moves closer to the time control. On which he would gain another hour on the clock. And here he decided to go g3. Now bishop d4 by Richard, threatening checkmate on f2. So the problem here is if you go rook e2, black gives a check and then picks up this pawn over here. And here black has two pawns for the exchange. So black should be completely fine. And I would even argue that if anyone is better, it might be black here. Um, so Ding played queen e2, now queen c3, another very nice move by Richard. Because if you go king g2, now there's queen c6 check. And you pick up the pawn on a4 and black is completely fine. So rook d1 was played by ding and queen c6 anyway. Because you throw in checkmate on h1 so white cannot capture over here. That would be very unfortunate. So ding played queen g4. Making sure that this pawn on a4 is protected if black were to move the bishop. Richard played e5. And here, you know, things look tricky for ding. Because he was getting down to a minute. And if black takes his pawn, you know, I feel like I would really prefer black. Because, you know, black, everything is nicely defended. We can start pushing this B-pawn down the board. But Ding made a very wise decision here. He decided, like, okay, I don't really have winning chances anymore here. Let's just force a draw with rook takes d4. Takes, takes, and after king g8, they went back and forth. And this game ended in a draw as well. So Richard stays on 50% with three draws. And Ding stays on one point out of three games. So not really the, the start that Ding was hoping for. I guess also not what most people expected. Uh, but still many more rounds to play. All right, now the next game that finished was the game between Fabiano Caruana and Jan Christoph Duda. All right, sorry guys. All right, so e4 by Fabiano, c5 by Duda, knight f3, d6, d4, and to be honest, so so Duda is playing the Sicilian defense, and he's going for the group, for the uh, for the knight of which has been his long time uh, main weapon against 24. But to be honest, I was a little bit surprised. I was thinking that Duda would play something a little bit more solid, like maybe, you know, e4, e5, play the Petrov, or just, you know, the regular knight of c6. But perhaps he was worried to get a slightly worse position against Fabiano and that he would grind him out, and maybe he just felt more comfortable in the knight of. Anyway, he took on d4 and played knight of 6, knight of c3, and a6. Now, last year in the candidates, Fabiano, after one year of preparation, played this move, bishop g5, against MVL and won a very nice game with the white pieces. But in this game, he's going for something else. He goes for the move f3. 
Right, be five by Duda. Now to be three. Bishop e6, bishop e3, and h5. Now to some of you guys, this move might come as a surprise, but the idea is very simple. Black wants to stop white from ever going g4 and g5 and kick this knight away on the king side. Um, so queen e2 by Caruana, knight bd7, uh, queen side castles, and bishop e7. Alright, so Caruana goes king to b1 and b5 by Duda. So this is a very typical setup. In the knight, you generally want to put your knights on f6 and d7, the bishop's over here. And black has weakened the d5 square by going e5, but as we see, he's got firm control over it. But nevertheless, Fabiano goes knight to d5, and here, it's not a good idea for black to take on d5 and go bishop f5, because white can go knight e5 and knight c6 and has quite a nice advantage. So instead of that, do that takes on d5. Fabiano recaptures. And if white manages to consolidate here, white's a little bit better, especially if you can get in maybe c4, put pressure on the queen side, or maybe knight e5 to c6 again. But the problem is black has this very quick knight b6, and there's no good way for white to defend the spawn on d5. So Fabiano is basically forced to give his bishop for the knight, do the recaptured, and now he went knight e5, once again to hop into the c6 square. So Duda played rook to c8, Fabiano jumped in with knight c6. And here, a very typical tactic in the knight of Baiduda, knight takes d5. So he's undermining this knight on c6 by taking the pawn. If white takes, black takes here and is up a pawn with a good position. But this line doesn't quite win a pawn. Caruana takes an e7, black recaptures, and now this pawn on d6 is hanging. But at the end of it all, after all these straights, and after knight c6, making sure that this pawn is not hanging, they reach an endgame which is approximately even. Right, so Caruana played rook to d2. Because he wants to develop his bishop, but if you go bishop d3 right away, then after king e7, your rook is getting kind of trapped. You don't really want to go into this. So, rook to d2 was played, king e7 by Duda, bishop d3, and rook hd8. So, I'm a little bit surprised by what uh, Fabiano did in the opening, because this endgame looks completely fine for black. So, I wonder what, you know, maybe he was surprised by Duda's opening choice, or what exactly went wrong. Um, anyway, rook hd1 was played, g6 by Duda, c3, and knight to a5. Alright, rook t2, hitting the pawn, king f6 by Duda, and after h4, he played the move knight b7. So he wants to bring his knight around to b, knight around to c5, maybe e6, maybe f4 in some cases, or d6 to f5, also an idea. So Fabiana played rook e2 back, knight to c5, and bishop f1. So Duda traded on d2 and played king e6, and... I mean, the position is probably even, but black has a slightly more active position. But like, if we look at black's pieces, they're a bit more active. Black can create a pass there in the center, a bit easier than white can. But Fabiano played the move c4. Now you don't really want to take, because this activates the bishop. So Duda played b4, and now his, nice, now his knight can never be kicked away from the c5 square. But on the other hand, white does have a passer on c4. So Fabiano played king c2, a5 by Duda, b3, and he played knight to b7. All right, so he wants to trade the rooks. So g3 was played by Fabiano, rook to d8, the rooks were traded, and after king d3, this knight found its way back to the c5 square. All right, you can't play c5 hoping for takes and king c4 to activate your king, because black has the very easy king d5. And then you take on c5. Like if you go here, you go knight c5 check. And then you take over here. And black's doing very well. Anyway, so king e3 by Fabiano. Knight c5 by Duda. f4 and a4 by Duda. So he's putting pressure on the spawn on b3. White cannot defend it, so white is basically forced to take. And now black can go for a very quick knight c3 to go after the spawn over here. So it feels like this endgame should be a draw, but still some work to be done here for white. Fabiano played c5. Now, if you take on f4, let's say, which will do it does, and you take on c5, now white has the time to activate his king with king d4 and try to go after this b-pawn very quickly. King d6 by Duda, king c4, and knight e6 going after the pawn on f4. Now, you don't really want to give, give black a 3 versus 1 majority on the, on the king side, so Fabiana played a very nice defensive move, f5. So black takes the pawn, but now his pawns are crippled. Bishop, f, bishop b2, hitting the pawn. 
knight f4 and bishop f3. And there's simply nothing black can do here because your knight is kind of stuck in front of its own pawns, what it's going to take here. So do the play knight g6, but there it goes one pawn. There it goes another one. There's one back. There it goes another pawn. At, at the end of it all, there's simply nothing left on the board. So this game also ended in a draw. So Fabiano stays on two points out of three games. Duda stays on 50%, has made three draws so far. But now we're going to move on to very easily the most exciting game of the day. Everyone was looking forward to this one. Ali Reza Faruja against Hikaru Nakamura. Now, both of them have, have played each other a lot in online Blitz and Bullet, but they've never played each other in classical chess. So how are they going to do? Ali Reza has improved a lot over the years. He crossed 2800 at the end of last year. But Hikaru made a, made a very strong comeback in this year, winning the FIDE Grand Prix. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump right in and have a look at the game. So Ali Reza opened the game with 1d4, which was already a slight surprise, perhaps. I was really expecting Ali Reza to open up the game with 1d4, and then probably the game would go into an Italian, which is what Ali Reza usually does. But I'm sure that Hikaru had prepared this. Anyway, so 1d4 by Ali Reza, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, Bishop before, so we get the Nimzo Indian defense. And it's move Queen C2 by Ali Reza, which is actually what I do uh, as well with White in the in the Nimzo. Hikaru castled, and then move A3. So Hikaru took on C3, Ali Reza recaptured, and then move D5 by Hikaru. Uh, Bishop G5 by Black, uh, by White, sorry. And I also had quite a, quite a few games here from uh, the White side. So Black basically has three main options here, I would say. Black can take on c4, which is what Hikaru does. Um, Black can also play pawn h6, then white takes on f6. And white is generally a tiny bit better here, but black is very solid. Or black can play the most ambitious way to try to equalize, which is to move c5. But this does involve a pawn sacrifice, f taking on. So if you go d4, and black hopes to go for, for a quick uh, play. Anyway, Hikaru sticks to his guns. He takes on c4, which he's played. Uh, many games before, and after Queen takes the move B6, so Hikaru has had games here against Magnus, against Lekong Liam, against Richard Report, against Shakir Mamajarov. A lot of strong gems have tested him here in this line, but Hikaru, time and time again, has stood the the test. So Rook to D1 by Ali Reza, Bishop A6, and Queen A4 by by Ali Reza, H6, Bishop H4, and Queen to E7. All right, Knight of three by White and Rook to D8. And here's really where white has a lot of options. And a lot of moves have been tried here already. So, um, what Richard did against Hikaru in, I believe, St. Louis was the move E3. But this game ended in a very uneventful draw. Hikaru traded, played the move C5. Richard took. Take, take. G5 was played to get rid of the pin. Bishop G3. Queen takes C5. And after check, King G7 and Bishop E5, they went into this repetition. So nothing too excited. Richard just wanted to force a draw with the white pieces because he was a bit afraid of Hikaru in Blitz. I believe Shakriyar, if I'm not mistaken, played the move G4 here with white. Also very aggressive, trying to go G5 and rip open the king side. And Lekwang Liam in that tournament played the move E4. Anyway, also very uh, interesting stuff. Um, anyway, in this game... Ferruja plays the move queen to c2. So queen to looks a little bit off, right? Like white's losing a lot of time, but he's preparing the move e4. Whereas Hikaru had to do something with black, so he plays the move c5. Now e4 by white. We see trade in f1. So white loses the right to castle, but white is trying the very direct e5. And there's no good way for black to get out of this pin. So Hikaru only had, had one move, which was to go g5. And now Elirez, of course, doesn't go bishop g3, because here you just lose a lot of time, like play something like knight c6 and has a perfectly fine position. But instead of that, Ali Reza unleashes knight takes g5. A peace sacrifice. So Hikaru took, bishop takes. And later on in the post uh, interview, Hikaru said that he vaguely remembered this line and the move knight c6. But this is really where Ali Reza surprised him with the move queen c1. So I suppose that Hikaru was still familiar with the move e5. Now black has to go knight takes e4, hitting this queen over here. And the lines get very, very sharp. Let's say white goes queen to d3. You go knight f5 to make sure that the queen cannot swing over here. 
White has to make sure that he can recapture with the queen on d1. Because let's say you go queen h3, your black can take, you recapture, and then after queen e7 check, now this knight is no longer pinned, so you can just move it here. Black is up a piece and is winning. Um, so white would have to go, let's say, queen f3. Black takes on d1, and you take with the queen. And here black has the move queen to b7. So white takes here, and white looks ready to go for checkmate. But black takes his pawn over here. And black is hanging on. White cannot bring a major piece to the g-file. In the meantime, black is creating a lot of counterplay. And black holds the balance. But anyway, as it stood, the move queen to c1 threw Hikaru off. Now, as was no commentary for this game, I expected that e5 was the move here for black. Uh, white has a couple options here. The main move here is the move d5. And after knight d4 to go rook to d3. A white city is very simple. I'm going to go rook g3 or rook h3. For example, rook h3, rook h6 to put pressure on this knight over here. But black holds the balance here. You can play the move rook to, uh, no, sorry, queen to d6 to get out of the pin. And if white goes rook to h3, you have knight takes e4. Very difficult stuff. This is the only move for black in this position to hold. White takes on d8, you recapture. And things look great for white, uh, for black, sorry. Because you have these two active knights in the center. Queen g5 is covered. Queen h6 is covered, but white can play this move f3, hitting the knight first. And here black has to go queen takes d5, pawn takes and queen takes, and after king f2 there's queen f5 check. Once again these are all only moves, and white has to go back to the e-file with a repetition. So probably this was Ali Raza's preparation. Alright, this is how the top level works. You try to come up with an idea, and just make your opponent find all the best moves at the board, and if they don't they're gonna lose, and if they do, you know, they, they make a draw. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? The problem for white is here that he cannot play king g1, by the way. Because of 92 check, king over, you take here, and after rook takes f5, there is checkmate. So, but yeah, good luck figuring all of that out over the board. I mean, maybe, you know, you're not sure. You might be wrong somewhere along the way, and you could just lose the game. So, Icar didn't go into that. Instead of that, he played rook takes d4. So, Ali Reza traded, played queen f4. Puts pressure on knight and f6, and black can defend with king g7 because then um, white gives a check over here, and you have to move your king to the h file. And if you go here, then stuff like queen h4 follow a bishop g5 are very tough to deal with for black. All right, so knight c2 by Hikaru. The other option he had, but once again, this is very difficult to figure out over the board. Is the move queen e7? White takes over here. And once again, it looks like white is just going for checkmate. But black still holds, move by move. Knight c2 check, going with king e2 and queen b5. Now, let's say white goes to d2. Black takes the rook on f1. And surprisingly, there's just nothing, there's no checkmate here for white. Let's say you give a check on g5, the king steps over, queen g7 check, king e8, king g8, king b7. And you take up a lot of pawns over here. But the king finally does find some sort of safety on b5. But now all of a sudden, white takes his knight over here. And if we make up the balance, black is up in exchange. But white has uh, three pawns for it. And he has all these passers on the king side. Now also take into consideration that the only move for black here to hold the balance is the move rook f8. So good luck figuring all of that out over the board. And then, then finding rook f8 and being like, yeah, yeah, no, this is fine. This is fine. Of course, I'll go into this. Well... It's definitely not that easy. So Hikaru said that he went for what was his original intention, but he kind of regretted that he spent so much time after that. So he played knight c2 check, king d1. The problem for white is you cannot go to d2, because then black has knight c4. You get out of the pin, and you pretty much solve all of your problems, and black is even a little bit better in this endgame. All right, so king d1 by Ali Reza, queen d7, king d6. Two and queen a4 check. And now for white, there's no way to avoid the end game. So Ali Reza went king b1. I mean, black will take an e4 and trade the queens pretty much regardless of white does. You cannot go to d3 because then after d8, you just walk yourself into a mating net. Congratulations. So king b1 by Ali Reza takes, takes, takes. And bishop f4. So bishop f4 was pretty much the last move by Ali Reza that was still played quickly. And I assume that, you know, at some point you have to stop, or you cannot analyze every single move. So my assumption is that probably he had bishop 4 
So white is slightly better, and he thought, okay, if, we'll, if it'll get to this, let's play the endgame. Right, so Hikaru played knight f6, a nice move, because he wants to put his knight on d5, uh, and the knight on d5 can never be challenged, because white does not have a c or an e pawn. Ellie Reza played h4, knight on d5, and bishop d2. So white, of course, wants to start pushing these pawns on the king side. f5 by Hikaru, a nice move, stopping g4 for the moment. g3 and king f7, and also... Now his king can push up up the board. Okay, so Ali Reza plays f3. So with this move, he makes his intentions very clear. He wants to go g4 and create two connected passers on the king side. So Hikaru goes rook h8. Now, black city is that if white were to make a move like king's 2 black goes f4. Breaking of the pawn structure, because if this pawn moves, you lose the pawn on h4. And black is doing completely fine. I would say black is even better. All right, but Ali Reza goes bishop g5 to make sure that the pawn on h4 is protected. And this is probably where Hikaru missed a chance to really equalize, I would say, with the move e5. White is still a tiny bit better, but, you know, black gets more active here with king e6. And I feel like had Hikaru played this, he wouldn't, uh, he should be able to draw without too much difficulty. Anyway, he played the move c4, expanding on the queen side, but this does give white the time to go for g4. b5, and now a very nice move by Ali Reza, rook to d1. So with the move rook d1, white is threatening to take on a 5 and black cannot recapture because then you hang your knight. So black has to do something about it. And it's not easy because the d8 square is covered. You cannot do that. If you play king g6, sorry, if you play king g6, white goes rook d1, hitting the spawn over here. And if you go back, well, then you then there's g takes a 5 and rook e5. White is still winning. And if you go rook to e8, then the problem is that white goes rook e5, introducing this threat once again. And Black just cannot keep uh, holding on here. So after rook d1, he carved on the only move, which is pawn takes g4, pawn takes, and here perhaps rook g8 was a little bit better to make sure that white cannot go h5 because the bishop would be hanging. And it's tough for white to make progress. After check, black will have to go to e8. But once again, this pawn cannot move, the bishop cannot move because then you hang this. So this probably would have been a better option. Because uh, then in the meantime, you can go a5 and b4 and create counterplay on the queen side. But Hikaru played a5 right away. And this enabled Ali Reza to play the move h5. Because after rook g8, which looks like a good move, you're hitting the bishop. And if the bishop moves, you hang upon g4. There's the move rook f1 check. And black is a tough decision to make here. Do you go king g7? Well, then you're no longer hitting the bishop. And white can just drop it back to, let's say, d2. And then keep pushing over here. Looks pretty scary. Or do you go to e8? And this looks nice for Black, right? I mean, you still hit the bishop. If the bishop moves, you hang g4. But here, White has a little trick. White has the move h6. And the problem is, if you take the bishop now, now there's h7. The h5 square is covered, the g8 square is covered, and White wins, because there's nothing stopping this pawn from becoming a queen. All right, so Hikaru played the move rook f8, because he wanted to, you know, offer the rook trade, and if this rook moves out of the way, then his king could at least come back and block it. But here's... Really, I feel where Ali Reza missed the big opportunity. That's not so easy, because if you go rook e1, black just goes king f7, brings his king back, and black is doing more or less okay-ish. You get some sort of blockade over here, and you have a pretty good chance to hold. Now, what Ali Reza should have done, in my opinion, is to go for rook h1. And if black goes king f7, then white is the very nasty move, bishop to d2. You hit the pawn on a5, black has to address that one way or another. So b4 looks like the most logical move, but now there's rook f1 check again. And if you go king e8, now rook c1. And all of a sudden, how do you defend this pawn over here? And here it really does feel like the black position is falling apart. But it's a bit subtle, you know, to move the rook to h1, then back to f1, then a c1. So not easy to figure out over the board. Eli Reza went for what a lot of people thought to be a winning endgame. He traded the rooks on f8 and now played bishop d8. All right, so this pawn on a5 is under attack, and it feels like black cannot give away this pawn. Because if you go king f7, white takes. Black does get this blockade, but white has two connected passers. And white should somehow be able to, you know, bring the king up, or maybe create some sort of breakthrough on the queen side. And it feels like black just cannot hold on here. So black only has one move here in this position, which is the move a4. But now after a4, white goes g5, and you cannot stop these pawns from getting to h7 and g6. But you have to stop g6 in the first place. So you can't play king of 7. And once again, if black gets one more move, 
you get, you get king g6 and black is holding because of the blockade. But white goes h7, king g7 and g6. And this looks extremely dangerous. If white is only able to put this bishop on the long diagonal, it's game over. Because this h pawn will promote. So it feels like black should sooner or later run into some sort of zugzwang or, or something, right? But Hikaru first played the move c3. And we will illustrate the point later. If black does not play the move c3 and plays the move e5, now white goes king c1. And here we'll see black cannot make a move, right? Black has to keep waiting with the king, so let's go king h8, then king b2, king g7, and white goes, let's say, bishop g5, king h8, and now king e2. And the king is going to walk around to f2 to f3 to e4, and white simply wins the game. I mean, if black goes b4, white is always in time. White can go, let's say, king f2 and fc3 takes. Black can take over here, but white is just in time with c4, hitting the knight. After a2, we take, and black gets a queen, but we have checkmate. So, pretty well lines, but it all does work out in white's favor. And that's, the main problem for black is that it takes too long to create a passer here on the queen side. So that is why Hikaru's move, let's go back, c3 is so important. He's changing off the c and b pawn so it'll, he can create a pass pawn later in the future. So Alireza takes, black recaptures, king c2, the knight has to go back to d5 to cover this square. And after bishop g5, the move e5. And once again, it, it's so weird. If white gets his bishop somehow on this diagonal, he's, he's winning. But the problem is you can't. Let's say you go bishop c1 and go bishop b2. Now that gives black the time to go knight e7 and go after this. Let's say you go bishop h4. Black is always going to keep waiting with this move king h8. And if you go bishop g3, black goes knight f4 to go after this. And the pawn in the game is actually winning for black. Because you have this pawn, you can create a second pass from over here. So Ali Reza played king to d2, king h8 by Ikaru, king e1. And now a very important move for, for black. Black has to play this move, otherwise he's just going to lose the game. D4. You have to create a passer before white walks the king around. Now, white can bring the king back in time, but now black goes B3 and has a protected passer, and now the king has to stay on the queen side forever. So, Elirazo decided to take the pawn, A3 by black, bishop C1, only move to stop this pawn, and now a very nice saving move, knight takes B4. It's really incredible how, move by move, black is... Black is surviving, and it feels like it's a miracle. The, the thing is, if white takes an a3, now black can give a check and collect the bishop. Or black could actually also give a check over here and go knight f4 and collect this pawn on g6. So Ali Reza played king to d2. Now black needs to make one more accurate saving move, which is the move knight to d5. Because after black, white takes on a3, there's the move knight f4. And once again, this pawn is going to disappear. So Ali Reza played bishop b2, knight takes g6 takes takes king c3 king takes h7 and the game ended in a draw so very very well top it felt like a real miracle that hikaru was able to survive in this end game but he did very important not to lose this game he stays on 50 percent and he's already gotten two difficult black games out of the way he had black against fabiano and black against ali Reza. so if he manages to get going later on he definitely has good chance to win as it currently stands Fabiana Caruana and Jan Pomniacci are still tied for the lead. Then there's a pack of players on 50%, including Hikaru. And then there are two players on one point out of three games, which are Ding Loren and Taimur Rajabov. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed watching and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.